This presentation was written and recorded in Amaskachiwaskahiken on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Metis, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence this place and its stories. Much of this presentation is drawn from research I conducted in order to write a paper that was published in the journal The Goose this year, and you can find an open access link to it in the references section of this presentation. Impasse is a word that gets used quite a lot these days when speaking about energy transition, the Anthropocene, late capitalist addiction to oil, and the possibility of different ways of life that diverge from the current petrocultural Canadian society. In this presentation, I would like to take up impasse in the literary imaginative sense of a fundamental psychological block, or freeze response, to the threats posed by the Anthropocene, which discourages future-oriented optimism, turning it always around again to face the past and present problems of global heating and conspiracies, of pandemic and patriarchy, of alternative facts, and disempowering politics. I follow Charles Stubblefield's diagnosis of the Anthropocene as, quote, a conceptual frame or prism that enables one to subsume diverse and seemingly disparate activities, forces, events, and processes into a condensed and comprehensible schema, unquote, that at the same time presents an overwhelming myriad of threats and crises, including, to quote from the call, sea level rise, climate migration, monster hurricanes and wildfires, and other catastrophes associated with the out-of-control overheating of our planet, mass shootings, resurgent white supremacy, the rise of illiberal democracy, the weaponization of social media, or any other number of the other ills that threaten to metastasize into full-blown planetary emergencies. The Anthropocene is simultaneously holistic and fragmentary, overwhelming in its vast unity and granular heterogeneity, threatening and impassive. As Amitav Ghosh so compellingly argues, the Anthropocene presents a challenge to, quote, our common sense understandings and beyond that to contemporary culture in general, unquote. We are experiencing the Anthropocene as a crisis of narrative in that viable alternatives do not seem to exist, so strong are the reductionist influences of its discourse. Ghosh traces how the realist novel is, quote, derived ultimately from the grid of literary forms and conventions that came to shape the narrative imagination in precisely that period when the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere was rewriting the destiny of the earth, unquote. I would like in this paper to turn to narratives in the genre of solar punk, a relatively recent development in science fiction in which the narrative imagination is shaped by early 21st century conditions of being. I present solar punk as a site of potential for resistance to imaginative impasse in its ability to tackle the Anthropocene from a position of embeddedness, and I argue that the genre is committed to quote-unquote staying with the trouble, as Donna Haraway puts it, and as such is a potent medium for connecting the speculative with the actual and embodying theory. Ghosh, in The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable, argues that the Anthropocene's multiple moving parts, its speed and pervasiveness, are causing a crisis of narrative for the realist novel, which has held pride of place in the arena of literature for the past 200 or so years. The slow pace of the realist novel, its general inattention to changing landscapes, its often deliberate ignorance of global politics except when it concerns a character's arc directly, makes impossible the generic attribution of the term real to literatures that do deal with changing climate, the rise of dystopian politics, the machinations of capital, and the use of what science fiction scholar Darko Suvin calls quote-unquote cognitive estrangement. Setting a novel in a changed version of reality in order to reflect back on events in the real world. Thus, novels like N.K. Jemison's The Fifth Season or Kim Stanley Robinson's New York 2140 are shuffled into generic confines of varying degrees of unreality. This is despite, in scholar Reese Williams' words, quote, a realism which ignores the growing instability of the Earth's climate increasingly feels like escapist fantasy, unquote. The Anthropocene, as a confluence of many often clashing narratives ranging from environmental to political to socio-historical to economic and more, is an overwhelming reality that is not reflected by realist fiction, yet humans are presented with no realistic alternate narratives with which to make sense of this epoch of looming existential threats. Consequently, the human threat response finds no recourse in fight or flight when it comes to the psychological impasse of the Anthropocene. Both reactions are useless, and so cognitively we enter what experts from the National Institute for the Clinical Application of Behavioral Medicine call the freeze response, or feigned death, as this PDF illustrates. To quickly summarize, in this state, quote, 
If the threat does not go away, the person may shut down completely. Heart and respiratory rate drop, and some people stop breathing. Muscles become limp. Metabolism shuts down. Endorphins are released. The person enters a state of no pain. They are no longer aware of their surroundings. Unquote. Importantly, the poster stresses that the freeze response quote, is not a cognitive choice. During inescapable trauma, this is a very adaptive way for the brain and body to respond. Unquote. What I want to propose is that in the absence of a narrative to help either adapt to or resist the overwhelming and myriad threats of the Anthropocene, many entered this frozen state psychologically, as imaginatively, our culture has not provided any ways out or weapons with which to fight off its realities. And I would like to propose a corollary, that the way the freeze response manifests in those who experience psychological impasse when faced with anthropocenic threat is in a narrative of denialism. Studies such as Carrie Marie Norgard's Living in Denial have shown that many people, when faced with scientific facts about catastrophic global heating, are more likely to deny or simply ignore these. They choose a narrative of business as usual that fits with what they have come to expect of reality. Denial, Norgard emphasizes, is not a lack of knowledge, but rather a failure to act on the reality that knowledge implies, creating what she calls a quote-unquote double reality, a false world where climate catastrophe does not exist, layered on top of the reality of the rapidly heating world. I am not a psychologist, so though I think this is a fascinating area of study that merits further investigation, I would like to turn back to a consideration of how narrative can be harnessed to acknowledge anthropocenic reality and work beyond impasse. Paul Hubener, in his book Nature's Broken Clocks, asserts that what literature in particular can do for humans in this time is provide a, quote, vital ability to both uncover and reorient human frames of experience, unquote. This is a major part of why I consider solar punk in specific such a promising site of psychological resistance to the current anthropocenic narrative. In 2014, researcher Adam Flynn drafted some notes towards a solar punk manifesto, Bold, anti-capitalist, pro-green energy, and challenging to futurist ideologies, it is essentially a diagnosis of what Raymond Williams calls a quote-unquote structure of feeling, and an urgent call to imaginatively resist and reconstruct the future. Quote, we are solar punks because the only other options are denial or despair, unquote, Flynn writes. He defines the genre specifically in effective terms, contrasting it against the nihilism of the cyberpunk future, and avoidant of steampunk's quote, potentially quasi-reactionary tendencies, unquote. Solarpunk is situated generically by Flynn as a development in science fiction that rebels against its own dominant narrative tropes and popular subgenres. Solarpunk can be seen as a successor to cyberpunk, in its origins as a movement that outright rejected the so-called Silver Age science fiction assumption of a techno-utopian version of the future. Cyberpunk rebelled against the idea that technological innovation would be an antidote to the political and socioeconomic ills of the 20th century and envisioned instead a late capitalist nightmare future as the inevitable result of their contemporary world of 1980s America. Solarpunk, on the other hand, is invested in a grounded optimism that rhymes with the intentionally affirmative politics of feminist posthumanist philosophy. Jay Springett's words in the Solarpunk reference guide up on screen here that, quote, as our world roils with calamity, we need solutions, not warnings, unquote. It's reminiscent of philosopher Rosie Bredotti's claim that, quote, it is not enough to be against, unquote. In the interest of generative futurism, critique must always be productive, mobilizing theory beyond negativity. Affirmation, according to Bredotti, is not optimism, but rather the process of transforming pain into praxis. Read, taking the anthropocenic moment and choosing to reject its denial and despair. Similarly, science fiction is a genre that has a history of different groups of writers employing critique as world-making, beginning with feminist science fiction writers in the 1970s critiquing the genre's blindness to issues of gender and the projection of sexist tropes into a supposedly more advanced future, and progressing to queer, indigenous, and writers of color upending heteronormativity and white supremacy in the pages of science fiction novels to write into existence more just realities and livable futures. These narratives create moments of resistance to the status quo, provide glimmers of utopian hope, and let readers know that contemporary heteropatriarchal white supremacist reality is not inevitable. These narratives open the imagination to realize that there are different modes of living, different ways of building community, of living with one's environment. 
Solar punk is a successor in many ways of these movements, and its literature and art deliberately attempts to estrange viewers and readers from heteropatriarchal capitalism in service of political, socioeconomic, and environmental change. Significantly, it estranges readers from the toxic ideology of anthropocentrism, or capital H humanism, that provides the fuel for so many of the different threats of the Anthropocene. The capital H human is a construction of Enlightenment thinking. He represents an exclusionary human ideal as embodied in Bredotti's example of da Vinci's Vitruvian man, an able-bodied European cis man. His heterosexuality and adherence to Christianity is implied by his creator and the societal norms of Western Europe of the late 15th century. It is after him that the humanities are named, and recently he has undergone some modernist and capitalist moldings. Posthumanism rests on critiquing the capital H human as the universal representative of the human species. More recently, it has adopted a post-anthropocentrist critique of the species hierarchy with the human at the top, in favor of a biocentered egalitarianism, a rhizomatic web of relations where human beings are one node among many. Humanistic thought has, of course, made possible civil rights based on definitions of humanity, liberal notions of autonomy, responsibility, self-determination, and principles of equality, to name just a few of its benefits. However, it is important to be conscious of Bredotti's reminder that human is not a neutral term, and that it indexes access to specific powers, values, norms, visibility, privileges, and entitlements, sourced in the specific context of time and space of Enlightenment Europe. Yet capital H humanity imagines itself to be an aggregate entity or unified force where all humans adhere to the same specifications homogeneously. In their article on posthuman disability studies, scholars Dan Goodley, Rebecca Lawthorne, and Catherine Runswick Cole highlight that capital H humanity is conveniently allied with medicalization and psychologization as, quote, colonizing tendencies of the body and psyche, end quote. Thus, non-Europeans and the disabled become known by the fact of their exclusion from capital H humanity. The question of who gets to be human has riddled the discourse of the humanity since its inception, with marginalized or non-human groups such as women, children, the working poor, people of color, and queer people fighting long battles to be included in the category of human rights holders. And so, in feminist posthumanist philosophical discourse, critique comes around to posing the question, what is the use of adherence to the narrative glorifying the capital H human and his humanities, especially, I would add, at this moment in history? Like that of the Anthropocene, the narrative of humanity presents a false singularity when there is in reality a heterogeneous myriad. As Goodley et al. explain, posthumanism is an ideology that attempts to move beyond capital H humanism, rejecting separatism and isolate individualism and stressing heteronomy and multifaceted relationality. The Vitruvian man, importantly, is depicted as set apart from his surroundings. This is the individual par excellence, who relies on no one, is solely responsible for his own welfare. As Stubblefield points out, however, humanity in reality is, quote, a diverse panoply of humans existing within and interacting with nature through a myriad of cultural, economic, political, and spiritual rubs of meaning, end quote. Posthumanism, feminist scholar Hassana Sharp argues, quote, expresses the desire for an alternative to society organized by the ideas of human exceptionalism, anthropocentrism, and the masculinist models of man they entail. The narrative of the Anthropocene operates in the same way as that of capital H humanism, both presenting themselves as a hierarchical, singular ideology that does not acknowledge the complexities and nuances of its own constituent parts. In the spirit of affirmative critique, I put forward the genre of solar punk as a site of resistance to the overwhelming dominance of the heteropatriarchal, petrocapitalist, dystopian narrative of reality that is labeled the Anthropocene, which contributes to this disempowering, disempowering, despairing imaginative impasse. The potential of solar punk stems not merely from its capability of employing cognitive estrangement to move through the psychological freeze response to the Anthropocene, but also from its commitment to action. As Claudie Arsenault writes, quote, Solar punk is a movement as much as it is a genre. It's not just about the stories, it's also about how we can get there. Reese Williams analyzes solar punk's basis of green energy as representative of a worldview of openness, with solar energy providing, quote, a fruitful and flexible ground in the imaginary for experiments in being human and being social, while it also preserves the ecological boundary conditions of our own existence. And that is the root of solar punk, an energy culture that serves as a platform for experiments in being rather than a closure of it. Unquote. Thus, individuals enacting solar punk can and do make alliances with one or many of the following green energy collectives, 
microgrid enthusiasts, Extinction Rebellion demonstrators, Afrofuturism, gardeners, Black Lives Matter protesters, animal rights activists, indigenous futurisms, tree planters, water protectors, and movements for indigenous sovereignty, communal housing cooperatives, and many others. This solidarity potential is a realization of what scholar Stacey Alimo terms transcorporeality, which recognizes that, quote, all creatures as embodied beings are intermeshed with a dynamic material world which crosses through them, transforms them, and is transformed by them, unquote, and so necessarily contests the idea of human individualism, of being set apart from or transcending the world. Once imaginative impasse is overcome, community in the midst of crisis becomes thinkable and becomes possible. The Anthropocene era is a time of incredible complexity, but attempts to reduce that complexity, to force singular meaning or unified narrative onto the incredible variety of issues, plants, people, events, species, classes, genders, races, religions, and more that make up the globe, leads inevitably to the punitive imposition of a hierarchy of worth that judges who gets to matter. There is no way to make all these crises go away. Instead, solarpunk operates from a ground of what Bredotti terms radical imminence to the realities of the post-human condition, acknowledging the constant shitstorm of 2020 and refusing to look away from it. I want to pause here before concluding to emphasize that I do not want to leave my audience with the impression that solarpunk is a be-all, end-all, magic bullet narrative strategy that will help every individual human tackle their own anthropocenic despair. Solarpunk is a community of vastly different individuals united in a push towards a new energy paradigm, new social relations, and a healthier environment, but there are many interpretations of solarpunk as there are adherents, much in the way that feminism is a term that is ever-evolving and sometimes hotly contested within its own community. In fact, solarpunk is not detached from the conditions that it fights against, and so while there is a lot of emphasis in the community on resisting narratives of domination, those logics inevitably pop up and must be addressed. Solarpunk is non-Western in origin. The first anthology of solarpunk stories was published in Brazil in 2012, and strives for inclusion of feminist, queer, and black, indigenous, and POC theory and thought. And yet, as writer Rob Cameron observes, it still has much to do to break from science fiction's definition by and perpetuation of Western patriarchal norms and mindset and find, quote, a solid connection with the underrepresented groups it's meant to include, unquote. There is a pressing need, Cameron points out, for solar punk to detach itself from Western utopic aspirations if it is to be truly committed to anti-racism, as the Western utopian urge historically and presently generates dystopia in real time for marginalized and oppressed groups worldwide. So, while I am attempting affirmative critique in my presentation of solarpunk as a site of narrative potential, I must stress that it can be, for example, inclusive, pro-woman and anti-capitalist, but also eco-fascist, white supremacist, and classist at the same time. My argument in this presentation has been that solarpunk narratives can operate to combat disempowerment and despair through imaginative expansion, generative critique, and just futurism. I read solarpunk as a realization of feminist post-human theory, in its ability to break down and break open the category of human to imagine multiple solidarities and multiple avenues of resistance in the time of the Anthropocene. Solarpunk's position as a relatively new, continuously evolving genre positions it as a site of enormous opportunity, as it is both a product of and a call to arms against Anthropocenic petroculture, heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, ongoing planetary degradation, and more. I hope that this presentation has been useful and enlightening, and I invite you to read up on solarpunk, both as a genre narrative and a broader movement further at the links that I have provided at the end of this slideshow. I look forward to interacting with you in the comments.